Well, thank, thank you, thank you for the previous talk, talk to, talks too, and uh, it's a pleasure and honor to be here. And um, I'm here as a moderator of this session. It is a session on conversations inviting change and in, and the impact on a more compassionate healthcare. And we'll be having the pleasure to listening to Anna Berg, um, who is a general practitioner trained and hosts a community mental health fellowship, and Jen. Fowell, uh, the Program Director of, of G for GP Training, uh, the Mental Health Act Assessments and GP Appraisals, and also the author of the book um, Fighting for the Soul of General Practice, the algorithm will, will see you now. And um, I would, again, as, as Margarita said, with no further ado, it's a pleasure and honor to have you here, and I'm looking forward to hearing too. Good morning. Um, I'm just going to share my screen now and get started. Um, I'll trust that if there's any issues with hearing me, someone is going to let me know. <laughs> so firstly, um, a huge thank you to the organisers for inviting Jens and I this morning to speak to you about um, conversations inviting change. So um, we're going to I'm going to talk to you for about 15 or 20 minutes about conversations inviting change. Um, this is a work of John Lohner, um, who many of you I'm sure will be familiar with. Um, I come at conversations inviting change as a learner and a teacher, not as its inventor. Um, I will refer to it going forward as CIC. A brief introduction of myself. Um, my name is Anna Boyg. I've been a GP in a very deprived part of Dublin's south inner city for about 23 years. I like to say to my patients that I've been sitting in the same chair for 23 years. Um, I fear it is actually the same chair. Um, that has given me privileged access to the stories of my patients, always in very small portions, but they are certainly a group of patients who have amazing stories to tell. In my teaching work, I lecture in University College Dublin, I have a special interest in mental health in primary care. I'm a GP trainer, and I also host a community mental health fellowship. So at all times, I have two trainees with me. and We do a huge amount of video work. Um, I have used CIC for the last eight or 10 years in all areas of my practice um, and teaching. So briefly, the context. Um, you will be aware that this is, as I said, the work of Dr. John Lohner, he has written many books and articles. He has a background in English literature, medicine, uh, family therapy, um, and then finally medical education. So Charles Taylor said, we understand ourselves inescapably in narrative, making the vital link between perception or experience and the stories we tell. It is at the junction of healthcare and narrative that I would see CIC as sitting. Um, I was fortunate at a CIC workshop in Dublin recently to meet a very eminent academic called Laura Mazzoli-Smith from Durham University, a real expert in all things narrative. And being a GP and needing everything explained to me in simple terms, I asked her, all these disciplines, all this interest in narrative, is there anything they all agree on? And she thought about it for a second and she said to me, I think they would all agree that narrative matters. So that will be our starting point. I doubt you will disagree with me that narrative matters in healthcare. That seems to be the whole purpose of this meeting. I borrow the words of Arthur Frank here, serious illness is a loss of the destination and map that had previously guided the ill person's life. Ill people have to learn to think differently. They learn by hearing themselves tell their stories absorbing others' reactions and experiencing their stories being shared. CIC occupies itself with how to make this happen. Um, I will take a further step and say to you, I believe that eliciting narrative matters. So when patient stories are given space, we discover that they contain their own momentum for change. Being listened to in this way may help the patient to make sense of their experience it may affect their perception and may help their stories and experiences to evolve in ways that are helpful in terms of the trajectory of illness and suffering. 
I know from firsthand experience and that of all my trainees that unheard stories not only exacerbate the suffering of patients, but are a source of increased attendance, serious medical error, and stress to clinicians as they fuel tension and adversity in medical encounters. Eliciting narrative is a highly complex skill. I don't believe it's adequately taught in traditional medical education. And CIC is a practical, teachable way of beginning to address these challenges. The final step is to say that how practitioners tell stories matters. So doctors and healthcare workers tell stories too. Where possible, these need to connect with patients' narratives. So we need to listen first and then tell stories. There is a need to balance the narrative with the normative, and I will address that briefly. So CIC skills can help healthcare workers and patients to co-create stories or weave tapestries, as we like to say. So um, the, the slide that stubbornly wanted to be first, um, I would see CIC as applied narrative practice. These are just three of the publications of John Lawner. I would have encountered these eight or 10 years ago and initially tried to teach this techniques to myself from books. Um, really, it is an experiential learning that, that has brought me much, much further. But for those of you who are interested, maybe particularly the book in the middle would be an excellent place to start. So it's difficult to come up with a definition of CIC. Um, I looked at all of John's various definitions and I realized no two were the same. So here is a sort of hybrid attempt um, of, of mine. Um, I would see CIC as a model of advanced communication skills, which aims to promote curiosity and attentiveness. It aims, again, in the words of Arthur Frank, to give stories room to breathe. CIC is primarily based on ideas from narrative studies, systemic thinking, communication theory, and education theory. It can be used in the clinical encounter, in supervision settings, and in a wide range of professional encounters. At a recent course we ran in Dublin, part of the feedback was that people found it very helpful in dealing with their teenage children. So not just professional encounters. Um, CIC training involves a strong emphasis on the art of crafting questions. And I really need to emphasize that. It's, there is a linguistic element to this. This approach to interactions with patients and colleagues can take stories from familiar territory in new and potentially helpful directions. This is a quote from one of John's books that I think, again, helps to understand what we're doing. He says, what sets narrative practice, and he means CIC in this context, apart from other approaches, is its insistence on precise attentiveness to language and on the idea that, wherever possible, the goals of any conversation should not be predetermined. It emphasizes the need for conversations to be minutely responsive to the other person's self-expression from moment to moment. It offers precise skills for doing so and a closely choreographed and disciplined training and methodology for helping people to acquire these skills. Um, people are often concerned about the possibility to use a technique like this in what we might call the real world of healthcare. Um, I, I've been doing it for 10 years as have many of my trainees. It's definitely possible. <laughs> um, the challenge in relation to modern healthcare is to integrate the narrative with the normative. And CIC training explicitly recognizes this challenge and provides uh, the flexibility to navigate. John would never forgive me if I didn't include the dumpling soup slide. Uh, I don't know if you have a dish like this in Portugal. <laughs> But the idea is that the dumplings are the stuff of medicine. The tests, the diagnoses, the surgeries, the, you know, uh, the, the hard stuff. Um, the soup, if you like, is the context and the stories. So you need both. I would like you by the end of this short talk to understand how we teach and learn CIC in the hope that some of you may get curious about exploring it further. So in very practical terms, um, CIC teaching, certainly since COVID, can take place online or in person. And I would say both work very well. It varies from one to two day workshops to courses of variable lengths 
to ongoing supervision groups, which I've been fortunate to be in for the last three years or so, to a train the trainers course, which is a one year course that I'm about to complete. And Jens has certainly already completed. Um, there are also, in my experience, endless personal applications. So for me, that has involved all aspects of my work. So I want you to, to understand in a little more detail how the CIC group would work. And again, the emphasis is on experiential learning. While we might run a course with 20 people in it, for the kind of learning part, um, they will be divided into groups of usually four to six people. And it's almost like a play. Everybody has a role. <laughs> so the narrator brings a case, a real case. You may be familiar with balanced groups. It's a little similar in this part. So the case needs to be professional, not personal. So a difficulty with a patient, a colleague, a student, etc. Um, it needs to be current, it needs to be your own, and it needs to be unresolved. The supervisor who volunteers to, to do this role then questions the narrator while aiming to follow the three golden rules, which I will uh, mention in a moment. The supervisor, in a way, has to work the hardest, but everybody takes their turn. Then there is a meta supervisor, usually an accredited trainer, who supports and, and kind of choreographs the group. And everyone else is called either an observer or a member of the reflecting team. They may be invited to speak about their own curiosities and questions and reflect on the process. We always reflect on the process rather than the content. In other words, people are not allowed to solve or try to solve the narrator's problem. They have to comment on the conversation. This can be called a reflecting team. So the three golden rules, um, and I consider this a practice which it's difficult, I'm going to say that. <laughs> so the three golden rules that the supervisor is asked to follow are, firstly, only ask questions. As people get better and better, an awful lot of detail comes into the, the nature of questions, but in principle, they need to be short, simple and neutral, which you may appreciate is much easier said than done. Each question must link up with words the narrator has already used rather than people bringing in their own ideas. And finally, you should avoid any advice, interpretations, suggestions until the end, and in fact, usually avoid altogether, and avoid giving away your own ideas by the way you ask questions, also incredibly difficult. Um, this emoji, rather unfortunately, is a very accurate description of how I always feel um, in this role, the, the urges we have to do everything else tend to be strong. Other things that are avoided include reflection, validation, summarizing, and direct inquiry into feelings. Then the group will evaluate the process. This is an amazing luxury. Uh, it allows us to focus on the effect of the questions on the narrator's story, and it invites the participants to begin to understand what good questions look like. The narrator gets the opportunity to comment on the experience, which also provides unique insight into what it feels like to be on the receiving end of questions. In longer courses or established groups, this leads to a trusted environment in which theory and practice can be combined. How often have I wanted to ask my patients how they experienced my questions? It's a difficult thing to get into. <laughs> so this allows that really unique opportunity. The seven C's is also used to describe what we aim for in CIC. Um, it, it refers, I think, to the stance, which is the goal of this practice. Um, it's, it's almost based on the premise that how we speak or how we ask questions actually affects how, how we are. Um, and the goals are to emphasize the importance of conversations, curiosity, complexity, challenge, caution and care, uh, and creativity. The final few slides relate to my own experience of the last eight or 10 years. Um, in other words, I continually ask myself, you know, what is happening in this process? Why is it helpful? So first of all, it gives, in my case, young doctors uh, or, or anyone doing the courses from all variety of health professionals supervision. Um, in other words, we get to have our professional suffering heard. It's an unusual experience in medicine. 
um, we start to experience the value of being listened to. I, I would say I, I was never listened to before in professional terms um, the way I, I am in, in, the, in the learning of this skill set. I guess if you value something, then you might be motivated to share it uh, with your patients particularly and also with trainees. When following the three golden rules, clinicians are asked to focus almost entirely on crafting questions and are confronted in very real terms with their tendencies to listen selectively, to colonize narratives and to rush towards wanting to fix. CIC training leads to the acquisition of a practical skill set oriented towards curiosity and attentiveness. You will not notice the word empathy in that. Um, CIC can give rise to moments of empathy and joy in medical encounters that I think can only be experienced when the patient field listened to and the pressure to fix is reduced. I see empathy as a complex emotional state that is sometimes reachable. I see attentiveness as much more teachable. CIC also encourages reflective practice, so both reflection on action and reflection in action. Bear with me, this is a, a notion I have. <laughs> I like to see CIC in a way as a kind of graded exposure, if you're familiar with that idea. There is obviously a lot of very important work going on in use of literature and art in, in medical education. I see these in a way as a sort of transitional space. There is a safety in this exercise. Um, but I, I hope you will allow me to say that live narratives of illness and suffering are not the same as text. To me, CIC kind of comes in the middle. It provides an exposure to live professional narratives, which are not as chaotic or as threatening as patient stories. In safe groups, so you're working with colleagues, and it teaches concrete skills aimed at maintaining curiosity and attention under pressure. These skills, in my experience, are then transferable as needed into real clinical encounters. The final goal, if you like, may be maintaining curiosity and attentiveness when faced with the chaos, the fear, and the kind of huge expectation that falls onto clinicians in, the, in, in terms of living illness and suffering narratives, which are stories in motion. And again, I, I love this idea. Arthur Frank says, if a narrative involves temporal progression, chaos is anti-narrative. I, I work with a very what would be conventionally thought of as chaotic population, and their stories reflect that. So it becomes possible to remain curious in, in this context. Um, I am almost done. <laughs> um, again, just a couple of things that I have noticed uh, about CIC. Um, I, I do think, um, it, as per the title of the talk, it has led to a kind of compassionate curiosity. So I believe that CIC encourages separation and not knowing stance. Um, whenever we ascribe motive to another person, as in you are doing this because, we discard curiosity and immobilize compassion. The person who knows nothing has given up on learning. That's a David Freeman, a family therapist. Um, working to approve, improve attention and curiosity may make complex emotional states like empathy and compassion more likely. I believe these skills are more teachable. I have observed that CIC skills may reduce stress in clinicians and in clinical encounters. Change is possible when patient stories are heard and believed. This is a complex task. I will briefly mention time, which is a huge concern to people. I would emphasize it can be used in very small doses. Um, and in difficult situations where time tends to run away from us anyway. The ability to pay attention often eludes us when we most need it. CIC can help by providing a technique, which is comforting, I would say, to draw on. It can be highly containing in moments where clinicians are overwhelmed. CIC is particularly useful when there are no clear solutions. It dramatically changes power balance in consultations, and aims to release practitioners from the fear that what I hear I am responsible for, something I find trainees get very overwhelmed by. 
to finish um, a quote from Teresa Casal, uh, John Lohner sent me the lovely essay, um, the, the title of which um, meant so much to me. It's can you die from not being listened to? Uh, I certainly believe you can. <laughs> and now I have a slight difficulty here in that my picture is blocking the, the quote. Um, so maybe I will give you just a moment to read it. Um, what means so much to me about this quote is that she chooses a word attentiveness. And to me, that is absolutely critical in CIC. So what I hope, oh, and for some reason, my last slide now doesn't want to hear. Mm -hmm. What has happened? Um, the last slide contains only um, two pieces of information, um, and I'm very happy to share the slides with, with anyone who wants them. Um, firstly, the organization um, ANPH, A -N -P -H, the Association of Narrative Practice for Health. Um, that is where you will find out information about courses. And secondly, CIC, Conversations Inviting Change, has its own website um, where you can find, again, papers, talks, and useful links. Um, and I hope, um, so now without further ado, I'm going to stop my screen share and pass over to Jens. Thank you, Anna. That was really, really dense, lots of good stuff. And my job is much simpler. Um, I'm a street level bureaucrat, so I'm focusing on real life. And I want to say lots of this stuff, attentiveness, um, listening, getting lost in the stories didn't come as a surprise or new to me when I did the courses. I could look back at years and years of practice doing exactly this without knowing because I worked as a taxi driver in Berlin before and I relied on tip um, that was my money. So um, my trick to get tip was to let people passengers tell their story, pick up on little cues, pick up on stuff I see, pick up on their accent. Where are you from? What are you wearing? Who are you? What do you want to tell me? And that was A, entertaining. B, it was lucrative. That got me the money. And C, it was helping me to enjoy the job. And that these techniques, which I first learned on the street academy, and then more formal at the Tavistock. This is something I'm practicing day by day. It helps me to um, listen when I don't want to listen. The majority of time I'm under time pressure. I'm a GP and it's very robotic. It's a lot of drudgery, etc. CIC as a technique um, that is a performance helps me to love my job. I want to tell you two incidents and I want to make sure, let me know when I'm more than um, 10 minutes. First situation, not in this space. No, first situation was in a cell, in a police cell, in the custody suit. I had been invited as a um, mental health act assessor to decide whether a person needs to be locked up. Um, in psychiatry or whether the person can go home. He was um, outside in a tent um, looking disheveled. Some uh, dog walkers saw him. There was an argument, police came. He has a mental health history. So we were there, the social worker, the other assessor and I, and the guy said, I'm not saying anything. I want a lawyer, I'm not engaging. So I said, if you're engaging, you're still engaging. It means you're not engaging. That makes it more likely that you might get locked up. I'm not saying anything. The other assessor was starting saying more normative stuff. And that locked, that shut the, the guy down. He had, he had a watch, something like a Casio watch. So I started like chatting, saying, where's this watch? Oh, it's a Casio. Can... Uh, is it waterproof? Yeah, so it started just talking about the watch, like proper small talk. 
and I got lost. Luckily, we got lost in the small talk. In the small talk, he said he was swimming and he had pericarditis. He's on colchicine for it. Um, we are talking about all these things as if it didn't matter for the big assessment. But during this, it was clear he is very orientated in time of space, time and space. He knows about delusions and feeling persecuted, et cetera, et cetera. He has a cognitive distance and he had the emotional bandwidth to have such a conversation. So at the end, and the tricks, the link, the, the, the link to conversations inviting change was I applied the three golden rules. Always use his language. Short questions. Get him talking, talking, talking. Don't colonize what he's saying. Getting lost in his narrative. Narrative by doing so, connecting with him. So it ended up in a question. So would you rather, like my son asks, would you rather be accountable for for what you are doing? And you might uh, face prosecution, but you are um, you, you are the master of your actions, and you go home now. But the police may ask you, or um, is this all fabricated by you being deluded, and and you don't get charged, but you might go to a psychiatric hospital under Section Two? He said, "I'm choosing option number one." Conversations inviting change helped in drawing up the narrative whilst still liaising with the normative. Situation number two, um, we are on a home visit. The neighbor called the GP practicing. There's a patient, it looks all very neglected, grim, not engaging with anybody. Can you come? Um, we called, the door was open and was like coming into a scene of neglect, dirt everywhere. Um, everything looked awful, um, commode full of stuff. Um, and it was overwhelming. The trainee was with me and we thought, well, that is medically impossible. She might have all diseases in the world, liver cancer, lung cancer, etc. How do we do that? Again, um, A, by having the ethical stance of getting getting involved and listening and respecting seven C's, B, the simple technique of letting the dog, the narrative dog of the lead. So she told me about her losses, um, what loss she... So every question led to something else. It was medically not structured. But at the end, she said oh, it, uh, something about my mom. What happened to the mom? Yeah, she was beating me up always, the, the childhood. So without asking for, we arrived in very little time with respect at a uh, connection and at her telling me, hence building trust, that there was an adverse childhood. I never planned that to ask. It was not on my on my on my agenda, but attentiveness as, as a performance and certain techniques which can be learned. It's not that I'm genuinely nice. I'm not, but do applying these techniques makes me getting drawn into the narrative, and getting lost in the narrative is something very very nice, and I've never seen it as not being useful because you can forage so much information from the narrative for the normative that it actually makes life easier. And it helps people to listen to stories they didn't plan to tell. In summary, it works very well for street level bureaucrats. It's a technique that can be learned that is reciprocal for both the story listener and the storyteller. And it has the potential for change. Thank you very much. And here's the how to end. Um, we certainly are happy to take questions if 
but I appreciate it's probably your lunchtime also. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to listen. And yes, we were, we were wondering if everyone is very hungry and if lunch is, 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 is right now. But if anyone wants to provide um, uh, any question, you might go up here. Or sign up. Yes, 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 yes. Or sign up for the course. Um, if not, I, 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 I would thank you very much for the contributions. It was wonderful. Thank you so much. 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 Thank you so much.